In this tutorial, I'm going to be covering digital terrain modeling, and I'm just going to give just a really brief general overview, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the LiDAR data. So what is digital terrain modeling? We hear that term a lot. Two engineers at MIT developed the concept of digital models of the terrain in the 1950s. A DTM is a statistical representation of the continuous surface of the ground by a large number of points with known x, y, z coordinates in an arbitrary coordinate field. So what that basically means is there's a series of points that define the surface and we're saying that the surface doesn't suddenly stop, it's continuous, and these points have numerical values and it follows a coordinate system, kind of like a 3D coordinate system in x, y, and z. So it's essentially a mathematical representation of the surface. There's other terms that have been used to represent this process and are often used as synonyms, but they are actually used to refer to distinct products. So we hear a lot the word DEM, sometimes we hear DHM, sometimes we see DGM, and sometimes we see DTED. And each of these means something different. Let me go back to this one. So DEM, the word elevation, emphasizes the measurement of height above a datum and the absolute altitude or elevation of the points in the model. And this is the most common term that you'll come across. No, people rarely ever use the last three. It usually depends on the geographic region that you're living in. So in the United States, we use the word DEM a lot. DHM, this has the same meaning as DEM. The word elevation and height mean the same thing here. DHM term originated in Germany. There are other terms that have been used to describe this process and are often used as synonyms, but they are actually used to refer to distinct products. So we hear often the word, the letters DEM, which refers to digital elevation model. And the word elevation emphasizes the measurement of height above a datum and the absolute altitude or elevation of the point, points in the model. DHM, this has the same meaning as a DEM. The word elevation and height mean the same thing here. And DHM is a term that originated in Germany. So remember, sometimes it has to do with your geographic location of how things are called. Sometimes we hear something called DTM, and that's not really listed here in this list. And a DTM stands for Digital Terrain Model. And this represents a more complex concept involving not only height and elevation, but also other GIS features such as rivers and ridge lines. A DTM can also include other derived data about the terrain such as slope, aspect, and visibility. A DTM represents terrain relief. And DGM digital ground model, which is very similar to DEM, DHM. The last one, DED, DTED, this term is used by the U.S. Defense Mapping Agency, also known as DMA, and describes essentially data produced by the same process, although it is specifically used for grid-based data. So if you work for the U.S. Defense Mapping Agency, you may see the letters DTED a lot. So how is elevation information collected? With the advances of technology, there are several ways elevation or terrain information is collected. So what I'm going to show here is some of the most common forms of data collection. And I'm going to kind of describe it in a very kind of generic kind of way. The most common form of data you can expect to find at large scale is LiDAR. LiDAR points are typically spaced about 1 to 2 meters apart and they're usually not strategically placed. So basically the data is randomly collected. So you're not going to get curve information, you're not going to get stream information. Maybe you'll get stream information, you might be lucky, it depends on how large it is. Um, survey base map, and this is where you kind of hire a surveyor to go out and survey an area. Um, the point spacing can vary in resolution. They can be far apart or close together depending upon the surveyor. And points are usually strategically placed. So for example, if you need curb information, you're going to get the curb information. 
If you need spot elevations of significant landscape features, you're usually going to get those too with a surveyor. So I've mentioned the word LIDAR, and we haven't really defined what it is. LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So why is LIDAR significant to our profession, to landscape architecture and regional community planning? Well, the first reason is because it can create for us a digital trained model that we can manipulate in the computer. We can find and measure stream channels. We can generate 3D models of building and bridges. We can locate and measure vegetation. We can locate and estimate surface types, model floods or fire events, define watersheds and view sheds, map roads, center lines, and edge of pavement lines. So you can kind of begin to see like some of the uses that this type of data would have for us if we're in the landscape architecture or planning field. So sometimes when you go out to download LiDAR, you may see the terms FR, BE, LAS. So what does all that stuff exactly mean? So FR stands for first return, and BE stands for bare earth, and LAS means LiDAR data exchange files. And right now these terms may not mean anything, but I'm going to explain a little bit more about how this data is collected, and then you can begin to kind of see what these terms might mean. So how is LiDAR data collected? Well, there's a lot. There's an aircraft involved, a GPS device, and lasers. Actually, there's a lot more going on than just that. So you're probably wondering, how is an aircraft able to accurately collect surface information? A laser is used to emit pulses of laser light onto the surface and the energy is reflected back to the laser collector. Distance from the laser to the surface, surface type, and other information can be determined from the intensity and time of the pulse return. A thousand pulses per second are emitted from the laser while it flies over an area of land. So we can kind of see here with this graphic. This aircraft flies over, it shoots lasers, and it measures the amount of time it takes to get back to the aircraft and it knows it runs a calculation in the background and knows based on the amount of time it took for that light to come back how far away the ground surface is and it can determine the elevation so you're probably wondering you know with the aircraft moving around how accurate can this information really be well there's something called an inertia measurement unit which is attached to the laser scanner unit and is used to record the orientation of the laser platform during pulse firings and this makes sure that it's even more accurate. So this basically means no matter which direction or orientation the plane is in, the inertia measurement unit is going to be able to keep track of all that information. So now you're probably wondering, well, how does it know that it's not scanning the same area over and over? A GPS broadcasts corrections to the airborne GPS unit locating the aircraft within an accuracy of a few inches. The range finder scans across the surface at 100,000 to 200,000 pulses per second, collecting millions or billions of precise distance measurements, which are converted to 3D coordinates. Data is collected in kind of a grid-like pattern, and we're going to see that later on in another slide, how this data is collected. So we can see here this aircraft flies over, scans an area, and it actually does this in a grid pattern. So it'll go back and forth in a grid. The data collected comes in the form of a point cloud. So basically what a point cloud means is you're going to get a huge, massive collection of points. And each point contains XYZ information, so where it's located in the XY plane and an elevation information, which is a Z. And it also has what's called a return number. We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. We kind of mentioned it, but we didn't really define what that means. So a first return is the first point that it hits. The second return, which is denoted here in yellow, is the second point that it hits. And the third return is the last point that it hits. And sometimes you hear the word bare earth, and what bare earth essentially means is that all the points were processed and only the bare earth is shown. So any kind of trees or buildings is processed out of the LiDAR points and you only see the bare earth. 
So since we're talking about processing LiDAR points, how exactly is LiDAR processed? LiDAR points delivered from aerial surveying companies are typically delivered in the LiDAR standard LAS format. This format is a binary file format to minimize the total file size. However, the binary format requires specialized software or programming skills to read, edit, and manipulate. However, these extremely large point clouds pose unique complex challenges in problem solving and computation requiring specialized software and cleanly trained professionals to analyze the point clouds, find and eliminate errors, classify points into different kinds of landscape features, and generate both accurate and precise digital terrain and digital surface models. So you can see here in this example what the point clouds can create. You can kind of see some of the strengths and weaknesses of a point cloud. You obviously can't do cave-like spaces. It only does the surface only. So we're not going to see doors or maybe embedded on the side of this building. So some of the problems that you might encounter are vertical errors. So on the left side, this is the plan view of a vertical error. We have a point here that has an error. It's too high. And on the right side, we see an elevation view of a lot of errors going on here. Errors will consistently occur over water surfaces. This is because of how the laser pulse works over water. The intensity is returned slightly different, confusing the sensor, causing incorrect distance measurements. Sometimes you'll get some random errors of extreme high or low points, which can be caused by a bird or other unknown object the laser pulse might have hit. So all of these will have to be cleaned up. So usually what we do is we use Python scripts to try to, to automate the process of eliminating these errors, and they also eliminate human error. For errors over water, a boundary shapefile is typically created. It's kind of like a break line. And Python can be used to cut out the points within the polygon and paste them into a separate file. This would force triangulation to occur around the edge points, creating a water-like surface. So what triangulation essentially means is it's going to try to connect these dots to make a surface. And of course if you have extreme highs or extreme lows, you're going to have like a little peak or a huge dip in your surface. So by eliminating all those errors, it will be forced to triangulate around the edges, which will create a nice flat water-like surface. To get rid of some of the extreme highs and low points, maximum variables within the Python code can be set as constants to define the elevation of this geographic region. Anything falling outside the max min values are simply eliminated. So we kind of talked about this earlier, about how data is flown in grids. And here's an example of a grid. So through qualitative analysis, horizontal errors can be found. And what that simply means is we just look at the data really closely and see if there's any errors along the edges or where there's water bodies. Data can be flown at different times by different vendors for, for different regions and together a whole terrain can be constructed. So here's an example of Manhattan, Wildcat Creek, Fort Riley, KDOT, Junction City, and Kanza. When processing LAS files, file management is extremely critical. So for example, vendor A delivered Junction City tile 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 with only the southern portion populated with points. Vendor B delivered Fort Raleigh tile number one two three four five six seven eight which is essentially the same area with only the northern corner populated with points so which file do you use both will create a gap in your terrain data so we can see here in this example we have these areas where the dots are trying to be connected but it shoots across because there's a gap in the data so the file copied over what actually occurred is one file copied over the second and overwrote the first file. In either case, a gap would be created. The solution is to basically merge both point clouds together. And again, Python can be used to eliminate human error and automate the process of manipulating over 150,000 points in almost 100 files. We can identify overlapping tiles, copy the last files into their individual area folders, and merge them together and dump the results into a new folder. So this is the Python script, well part of the Python script that allowed us to do that, that I wrote. 
The last set of errors needing correcting can do has to do with the edge or where the map ends and there is no data. So of course, you know, ArcGIS doesn't know, well, the map has ended here, so don't try to, to connect the dots across there. So we see a lot of dots trying to be connected across here, which creates, of course, an error. So triangulation will occur across concave areas to the nearest point. There are several tools available to correct this problem, but many are incapable of handling this many points. So to solve this problem, one thing that I did was kind of manipulate the standard terrain processing model. So I added a whole column of tools in here to just kind of create a boundary and then use that boundary to process the points to create clean edges. So you're probably wondering, well, why do I have to know all this stuff? It's very technical. I mean, do I really have to remember all this stuff? No, not really. You just need to just remember a few key, key things like FR means first return, BE means bare earth, and why LIDAR is significant to us. So I'm going to give some examples of how LIDAR data was used. Landscape architects are increasingly involved in complex stormwater planning and design projects. So this is a flood that happened a couple years back in the Manhattan area. So this over here is Ray's Apple Mart. This is looks like Swab and Eaton. And this is another area where there's a subdivision that basically went underwater. So this is Wildcat Creek that kind of flooded one year during a really heavy storm event. It was really intense. It was short, but it was very intense. And as you can see here, it flooded. So one question people had, of course, the community was, well, we had all these floodplain maps. Why did my home flood? Because I'm obviously not in the floodplain. So why did my home flood? So one basic element of stormwater problem solving is accurate terrain information. At present, the most accurate collection of terrain data over large geographic areas, such as watersheds and catchments, is done with airborne LIDAR. These sensors collect millions of 3D elevation points per square mile, far exceeding traditional surveyor provider point files or, cloud, or point clouds, and provide highly detailed terrain surfaces. So we can see here in this profile that the orange line, or the pink line, is at a 30 meter resolution. The yellow line is at the 10 meter resolution. And the black thing in the background is the 2 meter LIDAR resolution. So you can begin to see that some of the flood volumes could potentially be incorrectly calculated with these different resolution data types, or these different types of data resolutions. If you're interested on learning where to get LIDAR data for this, ex for this project that we worked on, which was in Kansas, we actually went to the DASC website, so if you do a Google search for DASH, you'll find the DASC website. You do need a username and password to be able to log into it. They just want to make sure you're not a bot. And the other way that you can get LiDAR data is by simply contacting the county or other states to learn if they have LiDAR data available and where you can get it. And sometimes I found you just do a simple Google search. Like, for example, I can find LiDAR data for Nebraska by simply doing a Google search, and it's readily downloadable from their website.